Hello and welcome to Video House Church Special Pastor COVID Edition. Why? Because we had some positive cases of people here in the church and to ensure that no unnecessary compromises be made to anybody who is immunocompromised, uh, we decided to stay at home again to bring you Video House Church. I'm your host, uh, Barrett, with my uh, flower shirt and my erratic looking background. Sorry. It's the best I could do on such short notice. Neither here nor there. Video House Church is pretty simple. Uh, we start and we stop a video whenever you're given the cue so that we can observe the four elements of church there in your own home. Now I know it doesn't feel like it, but the early church most certainly met house to house. They didn't have big mega churches they can just jump right into and jump into their services. And uh, they, didn't have, they didn't have those things. Uh, indeed, Jesus promised something very powerful to us. He promised that where two or three gather together in my name, there I am in their midst. So you and the people that you are with right now, that you've surrounded yourself with, they are people that are sharing in the greatest company the world's ever known. You are in the presence of Jesus Christ. And if he is present there with you in that time, I promise you that if you dedicate this time to him, he will certainly guide it. So are you ready to go? Let's go. Let's ask the Lord's blessing upon our time. Heavenly Father, we come before the throne of grace with great humility and fear. And we come gathered with the people that we're surrounding ourselves with. And, and Father, we ask that you would make your presence more known in this place. We ask, Father, that you would move in our hearts to allow us to abound in love, greater love for one another. Father, would you heal any broken wounds? any broken hearts? Would you heal anything that is going on between us and the people that we're surrounding ourselves with? Father, if there aren't any hurts, there aren't any things that we're ashamed of between the, the midst of us, Father, would you be with our time? Would you bless it? Would you guide it? We dedicate it to you. We thank you for dying on the cross. We thank you for your death, burial, and resurrection. Thank you that it offers new life to those who would believe. So be with us, be with us, guide us and direct us this day. It's in the strong name of Jesus we lift these things up and pray. Amen. All right, as we begin, I want to encourage us to stop the video for a moment and reflect on each of these questions one by one. Uh, and starting with number one, how was your week? Number two. What made it enjoyable? What made it painful? It's probably one of those, what made it enjoyable? What made it painful? Share those things. Number three, who or what has been highlighted in your prayers this week? And finally, number four, I want you to look around at the people that you're with. I want you to look around at each and every person, and I want you to say something that you admire about the other people in your company. And I want you to follow that up with looking around at each of them and saying, I love you, and I pray God teaches me to love you better. All right, coming out of that time, we're going to move now into our prayer time. So I want you to share some prayer requests that are upon your heart right now with one another. I want you to pray for each other's requests right now, right here. Pause the video and do that. All right, good morning, Old Union. Uh, we hope that you have your Bibles. If you have them, great. If not, uh, I don't know what to do with you. First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians, open it up there and we will get started. We are certainly living in uncertain times, and I don't know if I have to remind you of the full extent of that, but our world is going crazy. Many people are very confused right now as to how they should live and how they should be living and responding to the times that we live in. After moving away from our reading throughout the book of Revelation, First and Second Thessalonians seem to have the greatest next step of our study in eschatology because it's one of the more predominant themes in the letter. Eschatology is the study of the end times. 
the final events of human history, the times people feel like they're living in right now. But before we unpack that, we have to unpack a few other things first. So before we get started, let's go to God in prayer. Most gracious Father, open our eyes to the wonderful things of your law that we may see what the aim, the intention, the understanding, the culture behind 1 Thessalonians, that we could read it and understand it, and that we could adopt um, the love that Paul has for these people, not only for ourselves, but for the people all around us, that we could pray the types of prayers that Paul prayed, and that you could focus our hearts on that this day. It's in the strong name of Jesus we lift these things up. Amen. All right, so 1 Thessalonians, where do we start? Well, we got to start with Paul. There's four people on Paul's second missionary journey. You got Paul, Timothy, Silas, and Luke. They landed in Neapolis, and then they went to Philippi from there. And you can read all about the success of their mission in Acts chapter 16 and Acts chapter 17. But one of the things that you're going to read about is how these four men are in Philippi, and it only takes them two months. Two months? Two months to establish a church with elders and then leave. They leave behind Luke and quite possibly Timothy, we don't really know, and they leave because of pressure from the city officials to leave Philippi. So they leave Philippi and they head west towards Thessalonica. Thessalonica is a major city center. Its population is about 300,000 during this particular time and an area of great commerce because of a good natural port harbor that they have in these large, rich agricultural plains that funneled into this area by the sea. So when this missionary band of men found their way into Thessalonica, they went to the synagogue as their custom to reason with the already established Jewish community as to why the Messiah had to suffer and die, and how that the Messiah was Jesus, the risen King. As Paul takes every opportunity he can to preach to the Jews there in Thessalonica, Paul also has a small side business, small side hustle going on. He's a tent maker. He manufactures goat hair into cloth and then uses the cloth to make canvas tents. Day and night, probably at a local guild or someplace that he can work out of. And for three consecutive Sabbaths, he went and he preached and he spoke in the synagogues but there's a large resistance that would force him to leave the city. Now, we don't know if Paul was forced immediately out of the city after those three weeks, or if he just left the synagogue. But I believe that there's a lot of evidence to suggest that Paul had a ministry that lasted longer than two or three weeks. I mean, to support this, Paul had gainful employment, number one. Number two, uh, Paul left a thriving church that had fresh Gentiles in it. It's pretty difficult to do that if it's just a three-week synagogue ministry. Paul also, number three, uh, would receive two large gifts, walked 100 miles from Philippi, where they had just left, and, given, and it was given to them at Thessalonica. So if two to three-week timeline for Paul in Thessalonica doesn't really seem as probable as three months. The church at Thessalonica surges to considerable size with Gentile converts. And the Jews, they become so incredibly jealous that they instigate riots and order to force the Polytarch to rule against the Christians who, accused, who are accused of upsetting society and opposing Caesar's decrees. Acts chapter 17, reading from the New American Standard Bible. Now, when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came, I don't know if that's how you say that, uh, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, This Jesus who I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of leading women, or the leading women. Verse 5. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some of the wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some of the brethren before the city authority, shouting, These men have upset the world and has also, and has also come here. And Jason has welcomed them. And they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king. 
Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who had heard these things. And when they had received the pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. Although Paul, Silas, and Timothy were not directly related to this particular instance, it seemed necessary for them to avoid the additional hardships upon their brothers and to leave and to go from Thessalonica. They took a missionary journey and traveled west, two and a half days, 50 miles to Berea. And they had a seven week ministry, successful ministry in the synagogues there in Berea until about 50 miles away, the opponents that forced them out of Thessalonica heard about their success, came all the way to Thessalonica only to oppose and disrupt Paul's preaching and teaching. I'm going to read for you Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 15. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those of Thessalonica, for they received the word with great earnestness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. And when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea also, they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as to the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Now those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens and received a command from Tylus and, Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they left. So while Paul is in Athens, he must see how the new church in Thessalonica is doing. So he sends Timothy to minister to the new believers there in Thessalonica. And a report comes back to Paul. And Paul is going to write a letter to the church at Thessalonica. Now, we could start off this series in a ton of different ways. But specifically, I want to start off this series by looking at and examining the two prayers found in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all of his saints. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. His prayers are to a thriving and healthy church. And so I want to encourage you to do two things right now. Number one, I want you to grab a pen and a piece of paper. And I actually want you to write out these two prayers word for word. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Pause your video and do that right now. Listen, if you stopped and you paused and you didn't do that, shame on you. I know it sounds like the worst thing I could ever ask you to do. You're probably like ready to end this video right here. Don't do it. That's the devil. It's the evil one that does not want you to write out these verses word for word because he knows. He knows that if you write out these two prayers word for word and you slow your brain down and you put your mind to it, you'll start to think about it and your brain will start to ask questions and your heart, your heart will interact with it. It'll interact with the scriptures because you're engaging and immersing your time, energy, and effort into it. Devil wants, doesn't want you to do that. So stop, do it if you haven't done it already. After having read through and studied 1 Thessalonians, it would do you really well to adopt the prayers of Paul into your own life uh, for the sake of not only your life, but also for the life of everyone else around you to flourish and to grow. So let's pray that the Lord caused the people in our lives to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people so that God may establish their hearts without blame and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all of his saints.
Let us learn how to pray over ourselves. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify me entirely, and may my spirit and my soul and my body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The powerful thing about prayer is that you don't need to learn everything about the depth of this prayer before we can start praying it. You will learn and you will grow into this by the grace of God like I have learned and grown into this. There is a sense of urgency that is stirring in the hearts and the minds of believers all across the world. And I'm telling you right now that I'm feeling it. I'm really, really feeling it. And it's terrifying. It's terrifying to think about how many people are not prepared for the coming day of the Lord. And I want to just kind of speak into your life right now. If you have someone right now that you have yet to reach out to, if you have someone right now that you have yet to forgive, or somebody that you've yet to share with, now is not the time to hesitate. Now is not the time to be lazy. This is the time to welcome Christ and his life-changing love into your heart and to also have that available for other people. The letter of 1 Thessalonians will help begin your study into the coming day of the Lord, a day that everyone feels like it's rapidly approaching. But first, you must read the letter, and I'm going to send you off this week to do that. Read the letter once a day, every day, until I see you again. Um, fantastic letter. It would, you would do well to have it burned on into your heart. So as we conclude in our time with one another, we're going to take the Lord's Supper with each other. It's a little bit of bread or a little cracker, a little bit of wine, a little bit of juice, maybe even a little bit of water. And we're going to spend some moments reflecting on Jesus and putting him at the center of our attention. Jesus teaches us in John chapter 6. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that they may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life of this world is my flesh. Now the Jews began arguing with one another. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. And on the night that Jesus was betrayed, I'm sure this strange teaching in John 6 had some new significance when he sat there at the table and he ate with them. Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 28 reads, While they were eating, Jesus took some of the bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Jesus assigned significance to these staple elements, and for 2,000 years, all across the world, believers have joined together in consumption and reflection upon these elements that you are about to participate in. So we're going to picture him with our eyes shut, our hearts stilled, and after you've spent some quiet and silent time before him, would you confess your sins, would you articulate it? Would you accept the love and the grace that Jesus has to offer? And then when you are ready, partake, eat, and drink. Whew. We hope to see you next week. Sorry for the delay. It's part of COVID life now. We may have more. Neither here nor there. God bless you all. Have a great week.